free to come on in if you want, I guess. Uh, this is kind of one of those flyer uh, uh, programs, uh, kind of like Bob Hall used to do, where he'd try and take out half the Midwestern Conference with a with a turkey tail uh, used as a bull roar kind of thing. It's just one of those ideas that Virgil and I had, and we'd kind of like to float it out there for feedback. Um, so we'll go ahead. Um, if you look at the early woodland in uh, in my area in southwestern Wisconsin and in kind of the southeastern Minnesota area, uh, you have two projectile point types. Uh, one is the uh, Wabasa point kind of type, the, the contracting stem type here, and the other is the Kramer point. And these feature two very different uh, base uh, systems. Uh, the Kramer point is, is more traditional. It's a very thin, you know, one or two millimeter squared off uh, sharp bladed uh, notch like most of the projectile points. But uh, the Wabasa or the Adena or the Dixon, it has multiple names, has a rather thick uh, rounded base to it. And this has always puzzled some of us that are into primitive technology and, and point studies because it doesn't seem to make much sense as a base style. It's too thick. It doesn't work well. If you put it into a regular willow or, or a, a shaft of, of any kind of hardwood, it's, it basically forms a clunky you know, a, a base style. And so it just doesn't seem to be very effective. And it's only, a, it's only around in our area for about 500 years, and then you would never see it again. Um, and so the question is, why does that take place? And Virgil and I had this idea that it might be the shafting technique and technology that's being used that might be to the key to this kind of weird point base style. And so we're projecting that we actually what a material called river cane, which is uh, uh, basically a, a southern material right now, but it, it, it uh, goes up to about the American bottom in its natural range. Essentially, American bamboo is what it is. May have been the deciding factor here. And so we'll get into this a little bit further. Uh, okay, geographic context. Uh, the area we're talking about is kind of what we think of as the upper Midwest, the deciduous forest Midwest. Uh, this is that big woods, driftless area in southeastern Minnesota. Uh, it's the it's the area south of the Pine Belt in uh, in Wisconsin, which is essentially from Green Bay, currently due uh, due west to Red Wing or so. Uh, these points show up in eastern Iowa as well in the west in the eastern half of the state. Uh, they show up in, throughout Illinois and through Missouri, and uh, these points continue on getting increasingly frequent as you go south, which also matches up pretty well with the river cane distribution. So that's what we're talking about as far as a study area. Cultural context, if we look at kind of the Western Wisconsin, Southwestern Wisconsin, Southeastern Wisconsin, we have basically two parallel uh, lines of early woodland. And the dating on these is, this is the pre-Havanoid in the, in the uh, or the Lamoille phase stuff in the, uh, in the Missouri chronology. Uh, we see evidence of uh, black sand, which is the terminology for it in Iowa and Illinois and Missouri. In Wisconsin, it's, in, it's from the Jim Stoltman sequence of prairie chains called the prairie phase. Um, this is traditionally, you know, the kind of the Wabasa, Adena Dixon points, and uh, what's called prairie wear or prairie incised uh, ceramics. And then we have a, a parallel and mostly we think earlier Marion Lamoille sequence, which we think links up with the Kramer points. But that's still very well determined. You know, we don't have a lot of early woodland dates, as you all well know, from Minnesota, Iowa, and El uh, Northern Illinois and Wisconsin. Uh, this pot here uh, is one of the, one we've, we just found recently in, in my area, uh, came out to about 220 uh, uh, BCE. Uh, we got very good AMS dating on that. And of course, it's right in the middle. It's both Black Sand and Marion. Uh, so, you know, classic archaeology. Uh, let's see here. So we look at the distribution uh, generally as it's known. Uh, black sand is a smaller area. Black sand continues down into Missouri and more into Illinois, but uh, couldn't find a good slide for this conference that would cover all of that. Marion's a much wider spread phenomena, uh, which again suggests that it may be earlier. Uh, black sand goes into the Weaver sequence. Uh, the uh, that you see in in Illinois and in uh, Iowa and into southwestern Wisconsin, Marion may be what comes into the uh, the Havanoid sequence, but they seem to be kind of two parallel tracks, uh, and they're rarely rarely found on the same site. 
So if we look at uh, um, the question of early woodland point variation, uh, this is something that, that Mike Strzowski at St. Cloud did uh, for the Wisconsin uh, uh, early woodland point sequence, uh, uh, one of Mark Munez's and Rob Mann's students. Um, but there's an awful lot of variation in size and base and uh, shape and, and things like that. If you look at you know some of these that Mike considered separate point types, these could all be points being worn down uh, in resharpening uh, from you know starting out as a much larger point and working their way down, or you could have knives versus uh, spear points here, something like that. But these are generally thought to be at level darts. Uh, so Virgil is a, a primitive technology expert and a experimental archaeologist down in uh, in Missouri, and he runs a, a social media site called the Think Tank for uh, the DIN, the Think Tank for Primitive Technology and Archaeology, which I'm a member of uh, because I'm interested in all things technology prehistoric, and uh, kind of an expert on atlatl construction and atlatl design and atlatl use. And he had an interesting idea, uh, what we're calling the Hayes hypothesis, which is basically that, you know, as far as hafting materials go, river cane is considered kind of the the uh, the steel eye bar of of, of uh, technology here. Um, if you've ever handled bamboo or split bamboo, you know it has these segments uh, in it, these little hard notch segments that separate the various cells of the bamboo, and then it's hollow inside. And what that does is it acts like a steel eye bar. It makes these things very straight um, and very stable. And you can actually put a lot more torque on these. And one of the ideas may be, this may be what they're using banner stones for. This may be that if you add the banner stone to a, a river cane atlatl, this may give you the extra stability to handle that, that shaft. Not, you know, if you've ever shot an arrow or, or thrown an atlatl, you'll see a, a flexible shaft will basically do what's called the archer's paradox it'll wobble back and forth, even as it goes in a straight line. And the more torque you put on that, the more that, that wave goes. So river came may be a way to stabilize that. Uh, if you look at the, the contracting stem points, this works out really well because this, um, this cell that basically is formed in the, in the cane or the bamboo is a perfect fit for that contracting stem point. And so if you think about why is that base rounded off and why is that base, sorry, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm too klutzy to do three things at once here, but why that base is rounded off and why it, it's shaped the way it is, it fits perfectly into the cell of a river cane. And this is, this is kind of Virgil's you know, epiphany, is that uh, river cane may have been what's driving the base shapes on these. It may be actually the half material. Because if you think of that Kramer material, that works well for your willow or your cherry or your alder, you know, your traditional at lateral dart materials, but the river cane really works well for these contracting stem points. So if we look at giant river cane today, uh, it's mainly focused in the southern United States in our current climate. Goes up to about the American bottom, uh, but it's heavily focused in kind of the southeast quarter. And ironically, this is also where you see the majority of contracting stemmed uh, projector points going all the way down to Florida and Georgia and things like that. And constructing stem point types continue throughout the sequence there. Uh, in our area, we only see it in that one area of the early woodland in general. So if we look at, um, you know, why is this stuff not up in our area? If, it, if, it, if, if our hypothesis is correct, shouldn't we have a natural uh, distribution of a river cane in that area? Uh, one idea that Virgil has is that it might be being traded in. You may have material coming up. Uh, one of the particular interesting things about river cane as a material is that it can be planted up here in Wisconsin and Minnesota now, but it can't self-propagate. Right now in a region six, to high region five uh, garden zone, it does not get the temperatures it needs to self-propagate. So you can put a stand in and people do for decorative things on lakes and ponds. And it'll last for five, seven, 10 years, but then it'll die off and you'll have to replant it because it can't self-seed. But in a different climate, maybe that wasn't the case. And so we started with the idea of, you know, okay, in the late Holocene, uh, which is the sub-Atlantic II climate period, which is basically what matches up with these constracting stem points, what was the range of river cane? And would giant river cane have been available north of the American bottom during that time period? 
And so I, I thought, well, okay, no problem. We'll go look for pollen of giant river cane in, in uh, lakes in, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And it, of course, it turns out in the land of 10,000 lakes, you've got a great uh, limnological research center at <laughs> University of Minnesota. And so I asked their, their chair there, um, you know, could river cane have existed in this time, in this late Holocene subatlantic period? Said, sure, it could. The conditions were right for it. Uh, it could have come in. So the question becomes then, okay, how do you prove it? Um, science, you know, eh. uh, it's great for uh, animal darts, but it turns out it's not much use for anything else <laughs> right now. And so it's not, it's considered a pest species in the South because it clogs up uh, boat docks and, and shorelines and things like that. So there's not many botanists that are interested in it or its natural history or its spread or they even study it. It also turns out it's a grass species, much like wild rice. And so it cannot be easily detected in most paleobotanical studies. The pollen, it shows up as grass. And if any of you have ever done a pollen study at your sites, you know that you get 90% grass uh, pollen. And that could be anything from yard grass to wild rice to, in this case, river cane. And so uh, kind of you know, rats on that one, we thought we were stumped. But it turns out that there is a grass species phytolith expert, uh, a guy named Chad Yost that we found. And he had just, just did his dissertation on identifying wild rice uh, phytoliths in paleobotanical studies and in lake sediment cores. And it turns out that river cane does have a distinct phytolith. It doesn't have a distinct uh, pollen, but it does have a distinctive phytolith signature that can be detected by somebody who knows what they're looking for. And so we caught uh, Virgil and I contacted Chad and said, you know, we think that uh, these points are matching up with river cane. And he said, well, what's the distribution of, of <laughs> he wants to know what the distribution of the points are just as much as we want to know about the distribution of the, uh, of the, uh, the river cane uh, phytoliths. And so it turns out that uh, in Africa and in, of course, in Asia, river cane is a critical wood and a building source material. Uh, so it's very well studied over there and Chad's in contact with those uh, botanists over there. And so we're developing in a research project going forward uh, where we're gonna look at phytolith studies of uh, lake core settlements uh, in Minnesota to see if we can pick up all, and Wisconsin and see if we can pick up any signatures of river cane. Um, and then we're also going to look at use wear on these points to see if we're seeing any kind of distinctive wear pattern on these contracting stem points that may match up with the river cane, kind of this, uh, this uh, hafting mechanism that you get with river cane. If you put it in there, you get a fairly distinctive uh, hafting signature. And we think that probably if you, you know, have this flexing around in a, half, in a rawhide haft or a or a, a gut haft, it would leave some distinctive wear versus another type of material. It's a little bit harder than most of your softwoods. And so that's kind of our plan going forward. What we'd like to ask you all is, one, if you're doing paleobotanical studies, look out for a river cane phytolith. And also we'd like to know what the distribution is of contracting stem points in Minnesota. I think it's pretty much focused on the deciduous hardwoods of the Southeast, but I'm not sure about say the Minnesota River or that area. Uh, for other researchers that are outside of Minnesota, the same kind of thing. We'd like to get a better handle on where this is across the upper Midwest so that we can go and kind of target these areas for uh, lake core sediment uh, research. And uh, that's basically that. That's it. Uh, you know, collaboration is a wonderful thing. You've got a, a primitive technologist in Virgil. You've got a, a contract archaeologist and myself. And you've got a paleobotanist in Chad. And it turns out we were all kind of heading in the same direction. And... Uh, through the joys of the internet, we found each other. So I uh, look forward to seeing this coming up in the next couple of years as we work on this uh, project going forward. And uh, that's Ryan? it. I'll take questions. Yep. 